a privilege and an honor to be here and, and to be with such dis distinguished folks that are here from Brazil and from Yale universities and, and colleagues um, from elsewhere. I'm going to take an approach today that is really more from an institutional approach to this question. I'd love to show you my dance videos of mannequins in tropical rainforests, but I'm going to talk more to the, the subject that we have today. And, and I'm going to start out with the sort of the audience participation of my talk, which is to ask how many of you know Dr. Carlos Nobre or know of him? A number of you do. He's, he's an international expert on climate. He's a very renowned scientist from Brazil. He was former Secretary of Research and Development at the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation of Brazil. He's former president of the Agency for Postgraduate Education, or COPES, in Brazil. He was a member of the IPCC. He is a foreign member of the US National Academy of Sciences, a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, a member of the World Academy of Sciences. He, as, you, as you can tell, he's a very distinguished individual. And I'd like to mention this, as it already been mentioned here, is I mean, the ability of the University of Florida to attract such incredible Brazilian scientists, world scientists, to the university just doesn't happen overnight. It happens because of a long history of connections. And so, you know, we do have the pleasure of working and beginning collaborations with Dr. Nobre, but when you look back, I mean, our interactions with Brazil, I'm sure go be well beyond or before this time, but recently in the Gainesville Sun, which is our local newspaper, was this article that was published reminding us that a former dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences was invited by the then governor of the state of Minas Gerais to help them establish a university, which is now uh, currently called the Viscosa Federal University. And he brought that sort of land grant institution type philosophy of research extension and teaching to Brazil back in, in the 1920s and directed that for, for some time. So why the University of Florida and Brazil? There could be, a, you know, there's a number of different reasons why we have such connections to Brazil. One is our history and legacy of partnership with Brazil institutions. The, um, the teaching of the Portuguese language was mentioned uh, today about when it started at Yale University. It was first taught at the University of Florida in 1949, or 1914, excuse me, and has been taught regularly since 1939. We have the oldest center for Latin American studies, and uh, it was founded in 1930 and is a very active and engaging Center. We have a lot of our faculty and researchers that work in Brazil, a number of them are Brazilians, and we get a lot of research dollars from U.S. agencies to conduct our research in Brazil. And we have lots and lots of graduate students from Brazil over the years, a lot in agriculture, but a lot in a lot of other different disciplines as well. And, and we like to say we think we've hosted more Science Without Borders students than any other institution in the US. And so we have distinguished alumni as well. For the program I'm involved in and the topic that more fits today, I'm a director of the Tropical Conservation Development Program, we can trace our roots back really to when Charles Wagley, a very well-known anthropologist, left Columbia University after a long distinguished career there to join us at the University of Florida. And so our legacy began with Charles Wagley, and together with Marianne Schmink, an anthropologist, and Chuck Wood, a sociologist, they started the Amazon Research and Training Program. And many of the components of this program that began in the 1980s are still components that are so integral to us today, including, very importantly, you know, getting people to the field, providing money for people to get to the field, but having these collaborations with Brazilian scientists and others um, from government and from NGOs and so forth, collaborating with them and starting long-term lasting collaborations which are so important in order to build a sense of trust and a level of comfort that allows you to share ideas and different worldviews with each other. 
So one of the, I'm showing you a, one of the newsletters that came out in 1989. I want to draw your attention to just a couple of things. One, it's talking about one of the relationships we have with the, uni the Federal University of Acre, which is a collaborative program that began sometime in the 80s and is still ongoing and very strong today, addressing a lot of different questions of relevance to this topic. And the other is really, this is when the Tropical Conservation Development Program began with a, a grant from the Ford Foundation. And as it says there, the grant is designed to sort of strengthen interdisciplinary research, training, and curriculum development to address the related problems of biological conservation and the livelihoods of rural poor in Latin America. And for those of you that you know are not as old as some of us here, the and is really important. And as my colleague Emilio Bruna says, it's kind of it's almost like it's you know a revolutionary ampersand. Because back in the early 1980s, and, and I'm an ecologist, I certainly remember the sort of the dogma of the day is you're gonna build these national parks, you're gonna throw the people out, and that's what's gonna conserve biodiversity. So the real recognition that you have to combine, you have to view these as related problems, is really what drove a lot of the early um, ARTP program, as well as the Tropical Conservation and Development Program. And this is sort of our, our framework. And just very briefly, the TCD program does not give degrees. But what we are, we give a graduate certificate, what we really are is we're a community. And we're a community of faculty and students and alums and partners that all sort of have the shared vision of working interdisciplinary on topics of relevance in the areas in which we work. And so relevant to us here is this, this learning and action network. What this learning and action network really is, is our partners academic, NGO, et cetera, our partners that we work with in the field are really critical to what we believe to both our research and training components at the University of Florida. Because without those partners, without these long-term relationships, we, you know, we can't really practice the kind of research that we want in the field and have the kind of impact that we want. The other thing that's really important here is the skills. A lot of our students, whether they're from the US or whether they're from Brazil or elsewhere, come with a lot of really great professional experiences. They come from Peace Corps, or they come from NGOs, or they come from government. And they bring a lot of these skills with them and a lot of experiences that we share. But what we recognize is to work collaboratively, to work on applied projects, to work in a transdisciplinary fashion, or work in participatory research, these take skills that you don't learn in your home department. You know, to work in teams, to deal with conflict, to facilitate. These kinds of things are a real key component of our projects. And then frankly, I don't need to tell anybody here this, but you know, working collaboratively with local scientists, of course, is the right thing to do. And as for many of the reasons that are pictured on the slide, and of course we all probably recognize the infamous um, man who took 70,000 rubber seeds out of Brazil in, in 1876. But working collaboratively, collaboratively is also very professionally and personally rewarding. And my colleague, Emilio Bruna, uh, together with Stefano Alessina from the University of Chicago, dove into about a million articles and kind of analyzed these articles. And to give you the punchline of that, they found that inter international collaboration, if you publish internationally and collaboratively, you have more citations relative to other authors in the same journal in the same year, and you're publishing in journals that have higher impact factors. Now, believe me, that's going to help you get tenure. You know, So it's kind of important. And when I look at my field in ecology, what this slide is showing is if we use US as the base, these are the number of citations if you're from these countries or from collaborations among these countries. This is where the U.S. is. Brazil is actually just a little bit higher. But if you publish with your Brazilian colleagues, look, your impact factor goes way up. So again, demonstrating that these are good for science. 
and they're good for getting your research no noticed by the academic community. Well, it, it you really working collaboratively is hard. We all recognize that, and so you really do need, I think, to develop strategies and mechanisms for being successful in collaborative research. And this sort of shows some of the things that I think that underline a lot of the collaborations that we have. You know, the formal agreements, the two-way exchanges, north and south and, and south and north, but as well, south and south, the kinds of joint training courses that you can have together. And we think about it at a variety of different levels. For example, at the technician level, people that are on the ground, the practitioners in the field, um, maybe the groups that you're working with, or at the university level, <coughs> like I mentioned, like conflict management or environmental governance. These are just some of the examples. But at these kinds of things, these training courses, these exchanges, and so forth, are what are going to help you really develop these truly collaboratively applied research projects. You have to talk to each other. You have to spend time in the field together. You have to get comfortable with each other and find out where you have shared interests and, and what the needs are. And of course, the joint publications always help, but publications not only to the scholarly community, but we also help, hope to local stakeholders as well. So I want to continue um, and just give you a highlight of a couple of the examples from the University of Florida. <laughs> so we have examples at the faculty level, and this is my colleague Karen Kiner. There's a picture here of 1988, Chico Mendez is in this picture, and at that time Karen Kiner was a graduate student in forestry and just beginning her dissertation research. She ended up doing her research in the extractive reserve area in Acre, and for the next 30 years she has continued research in, in Acre with colleagues, her long-term colleague, um, Lucia Vought at Embrapa with other colleagues, Rodrigo Serrana at the university with former students of hers and students of, of these <coughs> folks as well. So this is a kind of the long-term relationships that can be built and that you can easily then bring your students into and have them meet other students from other uh, institutions in Brazil. And this really scary slide is sort of some of the evolution that we have had as a program, more program-related projects that combine a number of the faculty at UF, their students, and our colleagues uh, in academia and in NGOs. And I just want to highlight a couple of them. The, we got a big NSF grant, a training grant from that we called Working Forest in the Tropics in, in 2000, it was, 2001 or something like that. Well, of course, if you know these training grants from NSF, only fund people from the U.S. So we were able to get a major grant from the Moore Foundation right then that, that established our Amazon Conservation Leadership Initiative. And that paid for us to fund a lot of PhDs and master's students from Amazon countries. And overall, we had 18 PhD students, six master's students, lots of visiting professors back and forth between the two over those years with the idea of you really strengthening our relationships, but also strengthening, in particular, Amazonian universities. It involved a lot of the field courses, which I've talked about.